Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Um, I know Starbucks gift cards probably wouldn't do us a lot of good at this point because I'm standing between you and happy hour. So I'll try to make this light and walk through this. So thanks for coming in today. I'm going to talk about BIM and CAD to FIM and walk through that process. So in this situation, there's a, um, a little bit of a different spin on this in that has anybody ever been in a situation where they didn't quite get a job or they worked on a proposal and didn't win a, a bid or submit for something and not win? Well, a couple years ago, my son, my youngest son, played basketball for social reasons. He really didn't play it for shooting and running and stuff. He just wanted to hang out with his buddies. So the other coach of the one team decided to split the teams into two groups, the A team and the B team. So you can imagine for 13-year-olds, a B team was very you know, earth-shattering and confidence-breaking in that sense. So I volunteered to coach the B team, so in that sense. So initially it was difficult. We had lost our first two games. We won our third game, but the other team had four players, and we only won by one point. So it was a pretty rough beginning to that process. So uh, I'll go into this a little bit more later. So you might be wondering, what in the world does basketball and team sports have to do with BIM and CAD and FIM? And it has a lot more to do than you think, because today's subject's more so about change management and helping work together as a group to be realistic and work toward whatever the end in mind is that you may have, which most people don't define yet. So thank you for joining me today. My name is Matt Davern. I'm president and CEO of CAD Microsystems. Um, been in the business for 31 years. I was an architect. I got into CAD back when Lynn was showing the five and a quarter. That's what I started with, with 20 meg hard drives and stuff. And I loved it because, truth be told, I couldn't draw. So CAD was perfect for me. So I got into it, had no idea this was a career. So I've been doing it ever since. Um, father of three, retired basketball and football coach to many, and uh, have an architecture degree, and still love helping customers figure out solutions for this. So today we're going to talk about is working through campus planning, and working through CAD and BIM deliverables. And last year I talked about BIM and technology. And what I realized afterwards in sitting with many of the group here in, in different sessions was that they said, BIM is great, but we only have 5% of it. 90% of what we have or more, 95, is CAD drawings. How in the world do we do this? So I took a step back to that approach to try to work towards something a little bit higher in that sense and working through what I would call facility information modeling, um, which thankfully uh, Lynn gave me a little bit of credit for that. So what are we going to do? We're going to talk about a couple of things. Number one, we're going to do an overview. And what do, we, what do you need in this stuff? How do you ask for it? How do you work in this hybrid environment that I'll suggest? And then how do you go to the next steps for that? And in doing so, you know, we're going to work through this process. I'm going to give you a couple of uh, slides that will give you a couple of tips for those of you who think you're way behind. And what I've heard and gathered, more than half the people haven't done anything. So it's kind of like the bear. You don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun everybody else, right? So again, in this sense, we just have to get started with something in this process. And again, as I said at NASA, I heard many years ago, they were off course going to the moon over 90% of the time. This is NASA, but they always made it because they knew what the end result was. They knew that where they were headed. So I think that's what's missing with a lot of universities, that they just haven't taken the time. They're afraid to go out and start a process and a journey in that sense. So again, most times, it's not about the technology for that. Let me establish a little bit of a background, because I think it is imperative and important as we work through this. So about 15 or 20 years ago, when we were on the whole Revit in the BIM phenomenon, getting people in from drafting and AutoCAD going into BIM, everything was disconnected. We had spreadsheets, we had Word documents, we had AutoCAD drawings, we had some BIM models that were a complete nightmare and a mess. But we had to tie those things together, and nowadays, you see a lot more connectivity between the different systems as they're working to this. Is it completely there? Is it the utopia or the Wizard of Oz, as I saw in TJ's presentation earlier? Not quite yet, but at least the systems are better connected now. And people know that it's a viable option to work toward that. It's not islands of information as we work toward this. So in this process of working through this, we're trying to work more. We're based out of Washington, DC, by the way. So we work with a lot of higher education and government agencies. And they get to mandate what it is that they get to require for this. So we're trying to help them write their requirements. And it isn't just BIM, but it's everything else so that they can get what they expect and what they need will help them out for that. So it's about setting the right expectation. And in facilities management, it's about getting up front in this process and not waiting until you're the receiver of something that you don't know why you have it. So uh, 
several years ago, I was meeting with the director of facilities for the State Department, and they were getting PDFs, and she couldn't understand why they kept getting PDFs. So we looked back at her contracts, that's what their contracts told them. And we knew all the architects and engineers that were submitting to them, and they were taking their BIM models and flattening them out to PDF and giving it to them. The whole time she could have been getting that. So again, they changed a little bit, started getting that information. They had to figure out how to view it and rev it that they didn't have, but we approached that later on. So in looking at this, a little bit of background on CAD, again, when we helped people convert the CAD phenomena over 30 years ago, it was really taking a manual process and just converting it electronically and doing that process. And that has taken over 30 years to do. But at least it created consistency, and you could share files amongst other groups very easily for that. Um, you could draw to scale. You could actually do somewhat intelligent things like annotation, layering, so that you didn't have to go back in and redo things or make sepias of something. So you had the ability to share that information in a much more intelligent fashion. Um, wasn't quite BIM, though, as BIM came out in the 2000s. So as we worked through that process as well, uh, you know, that gave us a, a chance to make coordinated design models in multiple disciplines and trying to predict items into design fashion before it went to construction. And that had a big impact. And we figure if CAD took 30 years, this BIM thing is going to take about 50. So don't worry, you're not behind. We've got a long ways to go to get people up to speed on this. So in doing this, you could deliver a project faster. You could share the information. And the thing that excites us is Revit is a database. So that gives you unlimited potential to tie information to so many different places for this instead of waiting for that. So again, coordinating designs, connected data sources. It gives you limited, unlimited options to be able to share that information amongst many different groups for working in that process. So originally this was CAD or BIM or CAD versus BIM, and I changed it to CAD and BIM because it's a hybrid environment. No, who here has everything completely done in BIM or Revit? Anybody? Does anybody have anything in BIM? Okay. And most people just have a small percentage, and that is probably better off. So again, it's the boil of the ocean, right? Let's start small. Let's get a process in place. Let's work through this. There's been a lot of really good presentations thus far at the conference. And one of the things that's very refreshing about the CFTA conference, to be honest with you, is the sharing and collaboration of information. So again, reach out to your peers. Find out what they've done. Find out what worked well, and just as importantly, what didn't work well in transferring that information. So in working through this process, oh, one thing I wanted to point out, CAD, when we did drawings, most times we actually probably drew 50% of what was actually going to be built. Everything else was in general construction notes. We didn't actually draw it. When you went to modeling, now you've got to model something completely. What is a model? Is it the light switch? Is it the screws? I mean, how far down do you actually go? And that's when this whole LOD and all the different uh, definitions had to be done. So again, it was a whole new paradigm that people didn't really anticipate originally that had to be figured out, and we're still doing so today. So pros and cons of CAD. Well, CAD is easy. You can work with it pretty quickly. Um, you know, it, it's, it's got a lot of user base. In fact, our help desk, literally like 45% of our calls are still on AutoCAD. You know, really? Um, Revit, now maybe the Revit folks are just further along, but again, a lot of people are still using AutoCAD. It isn't going to die overnight. So the other problem is, though, is that a change anywhere is a change nowhere with CAD. If you change the floor plan, you have to remember to go do the elevation, do the section, do the details, and so forth. So it's not really tied together very well uh, in that sense. Um, good thing is you can kind of fudge things at the end if you have to get a submission out, right? BIM or Revit is far more intelligent. It's connected to things. It is a database. Uh, you can actually change a change anywhere as a change everywhere. You don't have to worry about elevations and sections and views. You're working on a model in that sense. And then you can actually just pull different views as you're looking at it, thinking of cameras and how they view that. So again, part of the other challenge was is that um, it takes longer to update because you have to maybe model more information. So the typical answer we used to get when customers were first working with this was, what do you want modeled? And they'd say, everything. And they're like, all right, well, how do we model everything? And then the prices, they tried to raise the prices on that. So that took about five to six years to get through that uh, process to realize, hey, we can do this just as quick anyway in this process. So again, a lot of advantages on both sides of things um, and working through this. What is a facilities information model? So several years ago when we were working through this process and we did analysis for companies, we said, all right, let's go to the end. What is it that you want in a report? Because ultimately for facility managers, 
That is your end result, is the report. A, a report, by the way, could be a floor plan, it could be a column report, and nowadays it could be a digital dashboard. So the information that you want to derive to make your decisions on in a daily manner will hopefully help drive how you're gonna pull this information into that. So part of this is integrating the data and documents about a facility, working through that, a collection of components that are tied to the different documents, and as you work through the process, and again, this is a journey, it's not a destination. I think many people think that they have to define the requirements, send it out, and within six months they have everything up to speed. And it just doesn't work like that. So understanding that it's a process and being realistic about it is far more important than trying to you know, solve all your problems in day one. And we'll talk about that toward the end of it. So working through this, really what is it for? It's to serve the occupants in a building, whether it's a home, a residence, a hospital, a campus, a uh, classroom. So it's about the occupants that are in that building. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do is to serve the community and the customers that are inside those facilities. So again, this comes back to doc documents, data sets, and that has a different definition for everybody, and that's why a common dictionary, an appendix, or index will help you define those information. Words do matter a lot as people are working through and communicating on that. So that is a big part of this, and really identity is more or less half the game on this. But why do you want a facility information model to begin with? It sounds like a lot of work. Well, right now, if you measured the rework that's done through drawings, spreadsheets, Word documents, because people can't find them, can't find the latest version, it's a tremendous amount of time, and that's a true cost. You know, if you look for return on investment, facilities management is typically about saving money. Most facility managers are not trying to make money necessarily. So how do you save money? Well, time is the biggest, you know, um, um, it can, should be one of the biggest allies in a facilities management department or group, and often it isn't because you're trying to recreate things with limited resources. So a central data source for data normalization, one place that you can update it, um, your consistency in identifying those standards and having things go across, whether it's a, a label, a name, a group, office, uh, and how you're classifying things consistently across that will give you consistent reports and the same information that people are looking at. The other thing that's so important is it needs to be easy to search and find. I mean, one of the best things about all the, the cloud platforms is people had to make it easy because it's on a browser and it's got to be something that works across multiple platforms. So thereby it made it easier for the programmers. They had to make it easy to use, right? And I think that the business and commerce and, and consumers have merged. You know, who here would use Google if you couldn't search and find easy, right? It's the easiest thing in the world. Have you ever put in an address, and before you're even gone through the third word, it gives you three or four suggestions? Well, I don't have to worry about misspelling it anymore, right? I can just do 701, knows where I am, and all of a sudden it starts to do that. Well, they've got a, an algorithm, and they've got a huge database, as you can imagine, on the back end. Most of our systems aren't going to be that in-depth, but again, that's the advantages of having that information that's consistent for that. So BIM, um, I would argue that the B should be dropped, it's a building, that should be obvious, um, and really the key to this is the information. The modeling, I just soon have it called management. A model should be pretty obvious, the end part of it. It's about the information side of this, because when I talk to facility managers for the last 10 years, and like, you know, are you going to BIM, are you doing this, and we don't need 3D models. And it's like, that's just such a small subset of what a true BIM model is, right? So it's about that information that you're working in within that group. So, Part of this is coming up with a plan and making sure that you have common group that knows what the identity is, what the goals are as you're working toward that in that process. So what do you need? Uh, you know, this is varied. So we talked to several of our customers and having worked with them for the last 15 to 20 years on facilities management and operations, you know, getting accurate information into the system was key to this. Having accurate to track people, space, and assets we'll talk about. In the building at NGIS, how do I tie that together? A lot of groups were working on different information in parallel with different, this, different resources, and they were spending a lot of time and effort, and then their information didn't overlap. So I think that those barriers are being broken down, but it comes down to the communication and, and really knowing what you're asking for. Um, one of the biggest um, misnomenclatures out there is, what are you getting? Are you getting as-built drawings? And oftentimes, I have to go back and say, that's an as-designed. That's not as-built. That's how it was designed and nobody updated it. So how do you know that it's real? So again, knowing what you're getting and understanding that takes a little bit of education, but it can go a long way to understand and be realistic. And if all you're getting is as designed, it's better than nothing. But be realistic about what's coming into your inbox. So CAD needs. Um, hopefully this is something that many people already have, right? 
Uh, I put it up because I think it's important for us to state and walk through. Uh, we've helped hundreds of customers over the last 30 years organize their CAD standards. Um, so hopefully this is in place. If it isn't, it's kind of a good cheat sheet. So everything from organization and content to the symbology so that it's consistent. Um, looking at deliverables and how you're going to define those. Um, documentation. Uh, again, don't forget about the education part to this, right? Um, and then future development to make sure that that doesn't die in the vine. If you're going to retire a CAD in the next 12 months, maybe none of this applies. But I don't know anybody who's that far along, especially in a campus that's evolving and growing as, as, as the need arises. They, they just can't retire that that quickly. So again, that's something to take a look at from a CAD standpoint. Components of BIM, um, my coworker TJ could speak much more eloquently on the details of this, but really, it's a, the BIM requirements are an overall guide. So what I relate this to is if you have, let's say, an Acura MDX, I have an owner's manual. Well, that's 575 pages. I'm like, holy cow. Well, if I shrink down some information, it's US, not Canada. It's a technology model. All of a sudden, the information goes down. But again, at least they've given me a guideline and if it's easy to use, I have a PDF version, I just search on it. I don't bother with it or go look for the appendix, right? So again, a guideline is meant to be considerable and it is a living document. Too many people think that they get it and it has to be the end all be all. Um, I don't know about you guys, but we're working on BIM requirements and documents across all industries and they're a living document as they get changed and updated for that. So again, there's five different sections in here which I won't dive into, um, but there's General requirements to talk about how you classify information, submittal requirements, modeling requirements, and there's additional tasks we'll talk about in a minute, and different appendices if you have different specific information for that. So looking at this and making sure that you have commonality in this, and I would also say that uh, though you may not have one that's exactly like yours, there are so many resources out there. Don't create it from scratch. Take a look at that, read through those, and find that situation, especially in the CFTA community. There's so many people willing to share to give you a starting point. And it's better than creating from scratch. So what is a BEP or PXP? It's called sometime a project execution plan. Well, when you have your BIM requirements, which is a guideline, the BEP basically gets very specific on a project. Now, that could be very similar in many of your common uh, buildings that you're working on. But let's say that you have one done in California has seismic conditions, or you have one in a very secure area that has special security requirements. That may have other specifics that aren't covered in all your other BIM requirements, but it's unique to an area, municipality, code, or need for that. So again, having a BEP also allows you to define things like, hey, we want an RVT file, or we want a COBE uh, file, and, and working through that process. So again, that can be very specific. It includes milestones, team members that may and probably does vary from project to project. So you, everybody knows who's involved, what's expected, and when it's due. So again, those are just two different areas for that. So additional uses that you might have heard, um, there's 40, 5D, 60, and 7D, simulation, cost estimating, sustainability operations, and maintenance. Why this always ends up being at the end, right? Doesn't mean that you have to get the other ones done. You may not be measuring sustainability. It may be somewhere else. So again, understanding that words matter and how you can classify that information really does help you when you're communicating with vendors or subcontractors on specific projects for that. <coughs> so what is facilities management? Well, in my short 30 plus years, it's three things. It's PPT, and it's not PowerPoint. It's people, places, and things, honestly. That's really what it comes down to. And, and the people can be occupants, visitors, patients, students, as you can imagine. Um, places are, it could be a campus, it could be a city, a suite, zone, floor, space, cubicle. Um, and then things are really anything that you can tie a barcode to, you know, whether it's a thermostat, a fire extinguisher, whether it's a fire hydrant, whether it's a door. So again, you have really those three particular areas that you might be looking at and trying to classify. So understanding that helps you to start to look at different groups that may have that information. Things, you could have IT that has quite a bit of information from data jacks, um, computers, projectors, and that type. So again, looking at this in that helps you to organize that in a fashion that can be uh, worked back with the other ones. So part of this is knowing how to ask and how to receive. So a big part of this is making sure that you know what you're getting into when you start to do this and educating yourself. Um, the most striking thing to this is that this gentleman's actually smiling. So I'm not sure if he went to happy hour and then got up on the electrical pool or what, but Again, understanding that is, is somewhat critical. Um, this is one that I just, 
I, I couldn't stop laughing at two in the morning when I pulled up. But these are actually flip flops, and they're holding oh my God. an extension. So, and they're drinking light beer to make it worse, right? Oh on, on top of everything. So again, if you don't have a plan, you just you just never know what you get into. So, um, I, I don't think there's going to be a sequel to that one. You know, that could be quite interesting. So, <clears throat> com compared to that, you like that one? I'll send it to you, Chuck. Yeah. Um, so. Good thing is, none of us are in the pool, none of us are drinking excessively, and we definitely do not have flip-flops holding our extension cord. So what are key questions that you need to try to classify and ask? Well, really, it's three different areas. We've kind of broken it into, you know, is the what. What do we need to track between these people, places, and things? And if you're more specific to that, and again, as we'll talk about, phase these things out. You may not have the information, but if you can phase it out, then it also lets your team members, contractors, and others be realistic about, hey, okay, I know we'd like to do fire extinguishers, we need a safety plan, but until we get the floor plans in place, let's do this in the right sequence. And it'll let you prioritize so that you can get things done in a manner that helps you accomplish that. Um, what current systems do we have? Find out, ask around. Um, one of the things I was amazed at 15 years ago when I started to do technology plans for FM groups was, how disconnected the groups were. IT, HR, security, I mean, I mean they, they just weren't talking. It was amazing. And those walls are slowly starting to break down, and that's a big part of this, is really trying to find who has what and understanding how that can work. And sometimes we get asked to be a mediator and facilitate that information. Why does IT want to share information? Well, they love space plans, and they don't maintain them. Why does the facility group want to know where data jacks are? Because they do renovations and they want to know where the data jack is. So there's a common ground there. Um, and then if you have stuff going one way, then they can't mess up your information. So there's a lot of common ground that you can come to by just looking and seeing what's in place right now. Um, the other thing is, how did we get this information? And can we keep it up to date? So you need to be aware of what's maintainable um, and realistic about it. And then another area that's probably just as critical, if not more, is who's going to use this system? And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, how much you know, traditional, how are we going to collect this information? That is one of the things that has probably grown and expanded. I mean, every two months, there's a new technology from uh, laser scanning and drones that I'll talk about. It is amazing how much is going. Um, does anybody here have an iBeacon or track everything? So guess what? Every one of us has one. It's called this. And they're tracking. The colleges now, you don't need a card anymore because the kids always carry their phone. And we can track this stuff. Um, I happen to have, my youngest is 17. Um, and when he got his driver's license, I said, well, guess what? I'm putting an app on your phone. He said, to do what? I said, to find out where you are. And he said, well, I don't want that. And I said, I'll take the car back, the insurance, and the phone. So it, very quickly, he realized. Um, and it tells me how fast he's going. He's, he's gotten used to it. He doesn't like it. but. You know, um, that, that's, I guess that's the golden rule. I'm paying the bills, so I want to know. But again, he can tell where he is. Now, he can also tell where I am, too, because I don't have anything to hide, and we're sharing that information. So again, all of us have this information. All of us are carrying iBeacons, right? And it's, it's going to happen even quicker. So the collecting is very exciting. Two of the toughest things are budget. How much is this going to cost? And how quickly can we do it? Well, go back to budget. What do we have in place for that? So part of this is using it effectively and working through this. And this is all a process discussion. This is not about the technology. Oftentimes, people think, I need software. Software doesn't solve problems. More times, it creates more problems to that. You know, what are you trying to accomplish? And I think if you're more realistic about it, it helps you to set those in place to work through that. So what? What are we looking at, at getting in this situation and, and working through this? So facility needs. Again, this group is probably well-versed on these type of things from planning, maintenance. We broke these into four different areas. This last area we expanded about 15 years ago. Being around DC from 9-11, it was pretty apparent and pretty sad how many people didn't know where their employees were. So it really became a big emphasis around Washington, DC and the rest of the country as it should have been for that. So working in these different facility needs and phases have allowed us to start to define the information we need. So when we talk about people, places, and things, um, you've got all the different people we may serve or may not. We may have residents. Um, we may have different places we need to work at. Defining that information is critical, and putting that into phases helps you communicate the expectation for that. Plan types is one of the things, again, since this is CAD and BIM, has a large part to that, and how do you tie those things into place for that? So um, real quickly, a story about a customer we worked with many years ago. 
And uh, they actually had five different software packages to create all these floor plans. Uh, the first one was done in AutoCAD LT, real high-end program. Um, the second one, uh, right there, the cost center, that was done in Photoshop. The evacuation plan was done in Corel Draw. <laughs> and this was done um, in, a, in a fire safety system that they had out. And this one was done by hand. Um, so they had five different ways they were doing this. You can imagine the amount of rework. So we walked through this journey. We established it. We, we set up a CAFM system 15 years ago. We got all this stuff up to date with AutoCAD. And over the course of about 14 months, we helped them consolidate this information. So they saved a lot of time. And thereby, within 14 months, we could justify the cost of a whole new system because of the time that they were saving, because their backgrounds were up to date. So again, that took time. But then it, they could start to see the value of sharing this information and having it in one consolidated place for that. So a lot of opportunity if you're willing to look at those uh, different sets of information. Again, I won't dive through this, but in looking at the planning, maintenance, renovations, and emergency, who needs what for what? You know, if you don't need um, something separately like a wall tape to do planning, I just need to know there's a wall there. I'm not going to do construction or renovation on this stuff. I just need to know that there's a wall there to get square footage. So understanding the different phases, that may be more of an advanced phase, but that becomes critical for that. And again, same type of thing as well. If you don't need to know the type of beams or braces or gussets that are attaching it, then don't ask for it. You know, don't over ask or over complicate and say, I want everything. Try to be more specific as to what's important to you and your group. So output types, um, work with a law firm in DC, they're moving their offices, uh, we get it into a system, and all of a sudden the facility manager's pulling his hair out, and it's because he's actually trying to figure out how to assign parking spaces. And he has literally a pencil and he's scratching it out and stuff, and I said, why are you doing that? I have parking spaces. I said, do you have this facility system? He goes, but it's a parking space. I said, it's a rectangle. I said, let's put it in there, so then we tracked it the same way. And we helped them actually move their particular space uh, from one building to the next. And once you have that, all of a sudden it could start to grow. As you guys know, we started working on asset depreciation. Because as a lawyer in this firm, when you become partner, and they had 89 of them, they got a $20,000 a year uh, allowance for furniture and art. So we had to track that, and, but we had a way to do that. Um, it's pretty nice artwork down there. Uh, so the end, security became an issue and all those things. But we were able to start building that process to work through that. So now, a lot of this information Everybody wants digitally, right? We want it on our phone, our computer, we want it live. We want to be able to track this information um, and having a digital dashboard. So there's a lot of potential to have this shared across many different groups. So ultimately, an FM strategy, you know, you've got CAD standards, BIM docs, equals facility requirements. And what are you trying to do? You're trying to build it so that you have a collection of data that's shared across groups, different documents for CAD, BIM, facility information. What type of photos do you need? What type of PDFs do you need? documentation. Do you need hard copy? Do you need this stuff? So again, understanding the information that you need and use today and working towards something more intelligent later will help you define that process. Different standards in place for everything from Navisworks to Excel to Photos gives you a lot of an opportunity for that. And then the CAD and BIM management, making sure that you have someone available to help you manage that process. And that doesn't always have to be in, in the office. So who? You have to know your team. Um, so again, when you talk to the team and knowing the elevator, you know, Wikipedia knows everything, Google has everything, Facebook knows everybody, but the internet, internet says that you'd be nothing without me, and then electricity chimes in and says, aren't you forgetting something? <laughs> so the point of that is, is that know who your team is and what their role is. We all have an active part to play in this, right? So if you work with your group and understanding their particular roles, we've kind of broken into three different areas. Those who create the data, and that could be external or internal, data managers who implement or set or update the data, and then everybody else. And that could be just the public, it could be a patient, it could be a doctor, it could be a student. You know, so understanding the audience is really critical. Another component to that is, is how are you gonna get that information and sharing that? Well, nowadays, you know, and used to have some facility managers work exclusively in AutoCAD, and less with Revit, but then they could use a browser, mobile device, we have customers doing electronic. We're actually doing scanning projects to convert hard copies into electronic because they can't even find what version they have, but they can't get rid of it. So we literally just did a 6,000 um, file scan so that they have electronic versions of PDFs that they could look at later, which they'll never look at. But legally, they just needed to capture that. But again, if that's what they want to do to do this, get them on board. Get them using this information. It's 
of tremendous value and they can help you in that process. How do you pull this information in? Um, you could get an alien like Rick has. He has a bunch of them to outsource they potentially find. Um, but the tripod scanners, scanners, drones, backpacks, this is incredible information with point clouds. It really is. It's fascinating how quickly it's growing. Um, and it's, it's one of our biggest challenges as a technology firm is keeping up with all the advancements because they're really changing quickly for that. But again, there isn't an easy button. You've got to work through this process, understand the limitations, understand what it is that you're asking for and what you're getting. And then when you get it, try to make sure that you can decipher that and work through that process. Um, IoT for buildings. Uh, we work with FM Systems uh, on our IWS solution. You know, they've got a lot of solutions as does Arcabus and other vendors, but it is amazing from the badging systems and what people are tracking with book, room booking, light sensors. Um, you know, I love the example when you've got to wave your hands to get the lights back on at six in the morning, but um, it's, it's definitely come a long way. I just installed some thermostats that actually adjust the thermostat in my house automatically for me. I'll see if it saves us any money. They claim it does, but that's, it's, Again, you have to be careful about what your outcome is going to be and if you want to have that information. So another thing I learned last year that it's impressive and I've suggested to many facility groups and they're using actively and I'm so excited is photos. You know, do you need to model everything? Sometimes you don't. Sometimes in a space like this, you may want a 360 photo because you really can see stuff. If anybody's bought a car and you've gone in and used that type of a software package, very effective, very quick and easy to do. When you're doing your scans, you can include photos as well. It's immensely valuable because you can zoom in, you can look and see what kind of switches are on the wall, what type of lights, um, the size of the room. So again, don't discount you know, photos that people are working with. So how do we pull all this together? Well, hopefully this isn't you working in the ditch with everybody else watching you, and that's probably what some of you feel like from time to time with this, but getting people involved in this is gonna make a big difference and looking at the different uh, obstacles uh, in this sense. One of the biggest things is buy-in. How do you get buy-in? You have to communicate a vision and a path for working through on this method for this. So in this sense, you know, I think it's really important to get the components of the facility information model and get a roadmap. Um, Knowing your goals. So let's say that we try to help our customers break things down into kind of three different particular areas. The power of three. Short term could be six to 12 months. Longer term or midterm could be one to three years and that can vary. And then long term, three to five years. Establishing that we're not going to get to certain things for three years, it may be disappointing, but it may be reality. And I think it's important to set that out up front because if management sees that, then they set realistic expectations ahead of time instead of trying to achieve something that just isn't attainable. Um, how are you gonna get those goals and your metrics? How will you be measured? How do you communicate that? Um, and looking at all the groups that are affected for this as you get buy-in. Um, what we found is as you start going down this road and get more and more, it starts to grow exponentially. As you get one group in, the next thing you know, another group comes in, and again, it's about communication. It's sharing those small victories that you may have. Hey, we actually now have a floor plan that shows our fire wardens and our fire egress plans, and it's shareable, it's up on our internet. Wow, where'd you get that? Then all of a sudden you start seeing people say, hey, can I get that floor plan? You know, so again, sharing that information is critical. You have to sell yourself on this and can't wait for others just to find you. Um, the three different areas with CAD, hopefully this is already in place for most of you. If not, might be a good reminder and a checkup. Um, make sure you have a CAD strategy, CAD standards document. They've been around for quite a while, but making sure these are in a place where you have somebody that's managing it, the, the standards are defined, having the right software and training, and most importantly is version control, uh, making sure that you have a place. I never realized until this morning that Windows Explorer was actually a document management system. So I've already learned something right and early this morning. So understanding that BIM 360 and Autos has a great platform to work with and there are many others as well. So knowing that you have some place to know what the latest version is, is very critical to this. Um, short term for BIM, the BIM strategy and requirements and a BIM execution plan, uh, or as it's commonly referred to now, instead of templates, you might have a showcase and working within the different content that you're sharing. Uh, appointing a BIM manager, oftentimes this may be an outsourced role. You may not be able to justify a full-time position for this, and you can learn a lot from others who are working with that. We have, uh, I think it's a blessing to be working with so many firms because it isn't that we know everything, but we've seen the ways not to do it half the time and go, ooh, I wouldn't do that again. So we can share that best practice or worst practice to help others avoid that same type of scenario and working through that. Um, try to get one facility on new construction that's revitized so that you can work through this process and understand this and working through that so that you can use it correctly. Make sure you have the right software and training. 
And using a pilot program as well is really critical. Again, try not to boil the ocean. So if we look at the same third tier for FIM, our facility information models, what is our data strategy? Most customers don't have a strategy. How do you want your Excel templates given to you? How do you want your photos, your PDFs? Those are things that you can be defining. So you can have a facility information requirement in addition to CAD and BIM defined to bring all that stuff together. Um, who's in charge of the, the, this information as it comes in? It could be a part-time role. Chances are you probably have somebody that's the go-to person in your department that usually manages this stuff. So again, they might be somebody that should point and work with that. Having a quality control process and naming convention in place, I, I can't tell you how often we've run across companies, even they're so advanced, and then they have multiple files with Bob 1, Bob 2, Jane 3, and you're like, which version is the latest one? And it's a hot combination of those. So again, don't overlook the basics to this. Um, make sure you have the right software in place, training, and again, a pilot project. Pick one project, and maybe you've done one that went extremely well, everybody utilizes the information and goes back to it often. So again, that's the type of thing. Use that as your template and sample for working through that. So medium term, one to three years, may look something like this. You can refine your CAD information, BIM documents. Again, these are living documents working through that process. Revitize more of your new construction as you're developing this or renovations and pulling that information in. Uh, implementing a master files process is how are we going to pull our document management and hopefully by this time you've got a good system in place, a good librarian, a good process for others to use that. Uh, making sure that you have something that's consistent for your external information. Um, we work on, on some of our projects where we are contracted to create a facilities information model and what that means is it's an as-built model from subcontractors and most subcontractors you work with are still using paper and pencil and they don't use BIM. So again, this is a challenge in a process even for subcontractors doing stuff. So you know, don't, don't assume that you're that much further behind some of the other tradesmen on this. Um, expanding your pilot project so that you have different combinations and different types of projects, whether it's a classroom, whether it's an auditorium, something that's a shared public space and looking at those particular instances. Longer term, well, hopefully you've got more of your campus set up and revitized. Um, you have a pilot program in place for other new technology you bring in looking at your DNC and O&M systems, and then you're tying into everything from HR, finance, IT, security, and the list goes on depending on your particular needs. Other future technologies, I mean, this stuff is changing rapidly how you can collect it, which lowers the cost and gives us a greater chance to actually enable this technology to help us in our day-to-day -day use for this. Um, you know, it's a basic um, chart, but basically it just shows usage over time. This doesn't happen overnight. It's definitely more like this, as you work through this process from CAD to BIM and working through that. So again, be realistic about that. Um, you know, initially, maybe you're just getting architectural models in BIM, and that's all that you're able to handle for space and planning, and that may meet your needs. You may have the other information there, but you know what? Don't get caught up in trying to analyze it and set it up if that's beyond the scope of what you're trying to accomplish um, in that sense. And then in time, you can start connecting to other pieces to save you time on pulling that information in. So, what do we have with the assigning the task leaders, making sure you've got some team members to this, um, looking when to schedule these, developing a game plan. You've got to share this. You've got to communicate so people understand what you're actually looking at. Make sure you schedule follow-up. It's, you know what, you have to promote this or it's not going to go anywhere. Um, I heard earlier today somebody said that they've given the same message again and again and again, and oftentimes we're brought in or another consultant that's local to you that can actually say, hey, this is really what you should do. You know, um, so again, don't discount finding some other help to that. I think oftentimes people think you just get it and you go and you run. Um, and I've used this for years. I think it's what it's really like is you have to live and learn and go through this process and be realistic in this so that people can actually make something, uh, make sense of that. And this is about managing change. You know, I, I think my, my son is a rising senior and over 25% of the jobs when he graduates college in four years, because he definitely will graduate college in four years, even though the national average is five, um, in five years' time, 20 to 25% of the jobs do not exist today. So how do you go to college to get a degree for a job that doesn't exist today? Well, the new generation, they're going to have to completely be ready for 10 to 12 to 15 jobs in their career. That's just the new you know, it's just how the new world is. You know, they, they don't know a world without Uber. Right? And, and so for us, we had to learn these things. They're going to be in this hyper-accelerated growth for working with it. Anybody here have ADD and honestly admit it? Well, I didn't until I got phones and text and calls and stuff, right? We all have a little bit of it. Um, you know, and drones. I mean, it, it's, it's scary what this stuff is doing. You may not have seen one today, but it's definitely watching you. You know, you got cameras everywhere. So it's the new world. It's happening. 
Um, you know, and again, this is one of my favorite quotes is Henry Ford, who said he asked people what they wanted, they just said, oh, we want faster horses. He may go fast and fast. Well, there was a limit to that, and they had to expand that technology to create that. So with the end in mind, um, you know, one of the things that I had to do with this during the Christmas break on my son's team was these guys were not the AU players and the high-level guys. I had to simplify the whole process. We had 12 plays, and the other coach was maniacal about this, and did, he was just crazy and screaming and yelling. So I pulled it down to three plays, and I made it fun for these guys. In the first five minutes of practice, I call it goof off. I just let these kids, these 13-year-olds that have been in class for 10 hours, run around, wrestle, get it out of their system, and they started to have fun. They started to play from this, and we won seven straight games. And these guys were not that good. But they played together. One guy threw it in, another guy rebounded, and they had a ball. And the best part was a team that slaughtered us in the first game, we beat by almost 20 points in the last game. And you know, the next year I had to coach all 15 kids, and that was not as fun because they didn't have as much to go around. But even today I see these kids five, six years later, and they think it's one of the funnest teams they have because we had fun, and our goal was to get better and improve each week. It wasn't about winning. They'd always say, and win. I said, well, that's up to you guys. So again, if we work toward a team and try to help promote that from within, it gives you guys an opportunity. Um, so in summary, you know, what do you need? CAD and BIM will help you get to the facilities information system. Um, asking how much uh, this PowerPoint made available to use a cheat sheet if you'd like. Defining where you're getting data and your resources for that. Don't forget pilot programs. It's so critical and so effective with new, any new technology and working through that. And bringing it all together, working with the right team members, internally, externally. And again, if you phase things out and you help people understand that, it helps you realize that. Um, at public companies are great at that. They know that if they don't set expectations correctly, their stock is going to drop. So again, we can all learn a lesson to set that expectation correctly as we work through that process. So just remember, you know, what you're looking at today will not be what you need tomorrow. So again, we have to constantly be looking and asking and trying to learn more for that. So. All right. Questions? Alex. All right, Matt, I'll ask you. You picked the hardest topic that's one of the biggest gaps in the industry right now. So uh, let's, let's just try to help you out here. So the challenge is this, this concept of SIM is great, right? Um, I actually kind of had a change in perspective during your presentation. I thought you were going to speak more about the SIM as a, as a deliverable. You kind of spoke more to it as a process and ideology. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. But it can't be, because that's too much information. Yep. So there is not a guideline out there right now, an industry standard, sorry, not a guideline, an industry standard that describes what a FIM is. So are you seeing right now a client defining what a FIM is to them, either as a deliverable or as a process? Because we as an industry can't really produce it unless we get into the project and then define it as a project team. And then all of a sudden, this mythological creature comes up out of the way like a live monster, and then we can all see it. Yeah. Uh, I would say I, we haven't seen it directly, but we're seeing components of it. You know, and I think if we're trying to help people understand, I think we need more involvement because a lot of people are standing at the gate. They're, they're kind of, okay, I, I'm not in the game and I'm so far behind Ohio State and Western Michigan that I, I'm, I'm paralyzed by analysis. You know, so I think it's a matter of, so no, I, the answer is I have not. And I don't know, if Chuck, if you've seen anything, you're um, versed and well exposed to many facility groups. There are groups that are starting, as you know, there are some groups that are being more specific than others. But I think the biggest thing is to unwrap your head from the concept of as built and start thinking about as, I, I say as maintained, yeah. as opposed to pen. Right? Think about what do you need to support your operations over the life cycle of a building and you got to start that conversation by understanding who your stakeholders are in your university. I think that's the biggest thing that's lost in this discussion. The who. To start solving an undefined problem. The only way to define a problem is to pick whose problem we're trying to solve. I mean, I spoke very passionately last year at the conference about what I call my three questions. And the first question is, who's going to use the data? Because until you can answer that question, what problem are you trying to solve? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, but, but, doesn't, doesn't here, but here's, I okay. agree, and here's the downside of being overwhelmed. 
I worked with a healthcare organization for four years as they argued over the perfect set of BIM deliverable standards. In those four years, they built $150 million of new capital construction with no standard. And at the end of that, they still didn't have a standard. And I thought, if you would have just started with something, even if it was a space standard, Walls, doors, windows, floors, because hospitals have huge issues around Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement, which is space for us. They would have just requested a simple model with walls, doors, and windows, and floors. Forgot about MEP where the vast majority of the arguments were happening. They could have at least gotten somewhere, right? And, and, and then they could have, to your point, then they could have built upon that and built upon it. I mean, most of the, most of the successful universities we've seen I'll ask the classic example, space. Their initial driver for FIM was space, period. Walls, doors, windows, and floors, because guess what building information models do really well? Calculate square footage. As soon as you have four walls enclosing a space, you know the square footage of it. I don't know about you, but to me, polylining is what bad architects have to do in hell for all eternity, right? That is the same <laughs> and, and I would prefer, I've polylined several million square feet in my life, and I yeah. The, so you, point, it goes back to what is truly important, right? Yeah, you said the kind of thing is, is a challenge for people, but what's so important about it, right? Is it the graphical that's so important, or is it the non graphical? No, or is it both? It's, it's no, that's what you were mentioning before. Yeah. But I think other people don't know where to start. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> and there's. And you, you had a question? Yeah, so sure. isn't, isn't the answer to your question of an execution plan? Isn't that what an, a FIM is? Technically, yes. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I applaud you in your presentation this morning was that you just got started and you start with something. And if your basis is space, then make that tier one and get what you need out of it. And again, I always go back to, it took me a couple of years, and I said, what do you guys need as a report? And I was like, oh, I just need this report. And I'm like, you know, all right, well, then we need to capture this information. You know, the worst thing you do is to survey a whole campus and go, shoot, we forgot to get the asset number. Let's go back again. You know, and that's why pilot projects are so important. It's not to try to do it all at once, but take something small to that, digestible for that. So, yeah. Western, um, Michigan, Western Michigan's initial entry point was campus visualization. They were struggling with stakeholders on campus being able to visualize the campus. Mm. They started with very simple models just to be able to visualize the campus. And then they went to space, and then they went to access. But that happened over six years. So we actually did uh, a BIM requirements that we worked on, and we couldn't get any involvement. This is from a very large government agency. They paid us a lot of money to develop the BIM requirements. We couldn't get any feedback on it, so, and we couldn't publish it. But what we did was we, we declared it a draft. Well, now all of a sudden, I guess, well, who did this? We're getting, we're getting all kinds of feedback now because it's published. So again, we couldn't publish it as the, you know, the Bible for them. But by putting the draft out, people are starting to look at it and say, oh, I didn't know you guys did this. And again, it's kind of amazing. But again, putting something out there to start from that. And to your point, Chuck, is you know, keep it simple. I mean, just and again, I think that's what I've learned since last year. It was very impressionable upon me talking to many of the group was that you know, CAD is still the predominant situation. So are photos, so are PDFs, so are hard copies. So let's not ignore that, but let's work toward it. And I think if you phase things out, you set a clear expectation for management or the ones that are going to sign the checks to help get the buy-in that's probably needed for that. Well, and, and you know, I'll use another example. Uh, the government organization we worked with, all they wanted to do was drive the population of their CMMS plan. They were tired of manual data entry. They were bringing a new building online with about 400,000 square feet. And they had estimated six people six months to do the data entry in the maximum. Yeah, <laughs> three staff years of data entry. They could find everybody yeah. before. So a really sharp constructor went, I'll do it for one. And they said, what do you mean? They said, we'll work with Autodesk and we'll push your data from our models directly into Maximo. And all I want is one staff year of wage salary to, to pay for the effort. And that was published as a 2012 AIA CAP study. I mean, we did that in 2012. That was them to them. They really didn't utilize the models afterwards, but guess what? We accomplished their first step goal. That comes full circle of defining what it is. Absolutely. Right? Your bin and my bin doesn't have to be the same thing. Exactly. <clears throat> it's
Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the end conclusion, is that it's what is it for you, and then making sure you have commonality amongst the group and peers you're working with, and starting from somewhere on that. So um, I thank you for your time and walking through this. And if you have any questions, we'll be up here all week. So thank you, guys. Have a good conference. Thank you.